Hi and welcome to App in the Cloud. Today I'm sitting in Stockholm together with Christopher Menu. I don't know if I pronounce your name right because my uh, French France is not uh, the greatest. Um, I don't speak French at all. I can I know bonjour and <laughs> thing uh, phrases like that. Um, but we're here for a uh, Samarin Mobile Dev Community Day, and uh, Christopher is one of the speakers that. And um, he will have an interesting session later today about stories uh, from his life as a mobile developer. But first, uh, welcome, and uh, I will let you to introduce yourself. Hi, uh, thanks for having me today. Um, welcome to everybody. So my name is uh, Christopher Manu. You pronounce it quite well. Uh, okay, thank you. Congratulations. Uh, so I'm a cloud advocate uh, within uh, uh, Microsoft. Uh, so the uh, cloud advocacy team is uh, mainly focus on two things. Uh, the first one is to uh, go outside, uh, outside Microsoft, and uh, tell everybody uh, the latest innovations we have in our uh, we have done in our engineering teams. So I'm glad to be here uh, today to uh, uh, to your podcast. And the other way, uh, uh, the other part of the job is to listen to our developers community uh, to understand their pain points and try to find somebody in the product management uh, group that is kind of responsible for that pain point. And uh, yeah, before joining Microsoft, uh, I spent uh, at least 10 years uh, creating uh, mobile apps and before that uh, embedded apps on wide range of the platforms. Okay, so you can say that you have a lot of experience with creating apps. Yeah. Um, what experience of frameworks, languages do you have? Uh, and what are you using now for development? I guess Microsoft yeah. technologies while you're working for Microsoft, but... So, yeah, I, I really like C-sharp as a language for um, um, as many years as it's been uh, uh, on the place. Uh, so um, I, I, I tend to spend most of my development time right now on mobile because I do al also a lot of different type of developments, backend, uh, AI and, uh, and other stuff. Uh, when I need to prototype something, most of the time I would do uh, Xamarin or Xamarin from apps, uh, C Sharp. I have um, a pretty extensive background on developing Xamarin apps on WPF, Windows Phone, Silverlight, UWP, etc. Uh, so I used to 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 work a lot on on C sharp XAML development, uh, but I've also touched uh, other frameworks. Uh, obviously, the native Android and native um, iOS uh, languages, uh, either Objective C, Swift, uh, Java, Kotlin. Uh, even if I don't have spent so much time in Swift, but um, a little bit in Objective C. And before that, um, I've done uh, also a few projects on Java Mobile, G2ME. Okay. If you, if somebody, uh, uh, some listener remember uh, that great time uh, on BlackBerry, uh, what it was kind of Android um, Java thing. Okay. Um, and I've prototyped a few things on other uh, exotic uh, OSs like uh, Firefox uh, OS, uh, etc. Okay, I started my mobile development career with the Java apps, not for real apps, but we used in school for and we build apps for Nokia phones and uh, yeah. things like that. But uh, no real apps. Uh, my first contact was uh, Windows Phone Seven, I think, yeah. for where we build a real app and then Android with Java. So interesting cool. to, to hear your experience. Uh, but you have a lot of great stories or weird stories, or do you say? Yeah, I, I I tend to say weird stories because uh, so I, I've done uh, I, I haven't counted the number of mobile apps I've uh, shipped to uh, to a public or private store, but uh, two of them may ring a bell to um, uh, every uh, auditor. Uh, the first one is uh, Windows Live Messenger. Uh, I've been uh, the lead developer of Windows Live Messenger for uh, Windows Phone Seven, uh, so I've worked. Uh, I was not at Microsoft at that time, but uh, I worked closely with uh, Microsoft Teams 
uh, to to ship uh, Windows Live Messenger at the same time uh, Windows Phone 7 shipped. Okay. So uh, I've actually started to develop on Windows Phone 7 before Windows Phone 7 was uh, product on the market. And I've also spent uh, more than four years uh, working for Deezer, uh, which is a Spotify competitor. Um, yeah, a I know them. Streaming service, yeah. uh, which is very popular in France, UK, Brazil. And uh, almost all of these stories come from either one of, of, the, of the other app, because these are two apps that are um, deployed on a um, wide range of markets. Uh, Deezer is, I think, uh, available in 183 countries worldwide. Uh, and it's translated in, um, nowadays, it's translated in more than uh, 30 languages, 30 different languages. So because you you have such a footprint, um, your, your app has such a footprint, you tackle some interesting challenges you may not have if you're creating a, an app only for one country or for one market. And uh, the other uh, aspect is, as is not only the footprint, um, it's also the number of users uh, where um, these are uh, only the Windows uh, Windows 10 app for these are is uh, ten of millions uh, downloads, um, and uh, when when you have such a massive usage, uh, you are pretty sure to end up to some weird corner cases you haven't uh, thought about. Uh, yeah. During your development, so yeah, it's it's a little bit of story I've collected uh, during all that time. Uh, but do you work with uh, one specific platform, these or all platforms? What what platform do you have? Android, iOS, and do you mention uh, Windows? Yeah, so so these are is um, is a bit uh, special in the area because um, so these are is available on Android, iOS, or Windows used to be available on Windows Phone and it's available on, on Windows 10 now since uh, since a few years. But uh, Deezer is also a web app and is also embedded in a lot of devices like uh, smart TV, like cars, like um, audio equipment. Uh, so we also had challenges because we are not only covering the major mobile platforms, but we were also responsible for covering almost any platform where you can listen to music. Uh, so it's it's much broader than on the platforms. And it was also, uh, for example, on the Android side of things, um, Deezer is also published to different marketplace. So uh, the Google Play uh, store, obviously, but also on other uh, selected stores because it was um, deployed in partnership with uh, some mobile operators around the world. Or, for example, for BlackBerry, we push it the Android app to the BlackBerry stores, so without having the all the Google Play services. Um, so yeah, a lot of a lot of different platforms. Okay, interesting. It looks like you uh, <laughs> have a lot of tellers. So, um, what is your first story? So uh, I think one of the story I, I really like uh, it's about localization. So. We, we we all know that um, uh, we have our uh, mother language. So for me, it's French. So uh, speaking in English is requiring me uh, a little bit more of CPU time uh, to be able to to speak uh, and to to be able to uh, understand English for 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 a day. Um, so we we tend to always prefer our native language, uh, but. You know, in in our kind of countries, everybody can to understand somewhat English. Uh, French is not well known for French people are not well known for uh, speaking English, but we can understand a little bit. So, as a as a developer, when you publish your application on different markets and not only your home country, we tend to think that localization is an afterthought. You can do it later on your process, but it's important to get features, to get traction, etc. And um, we have run some studies early on uh, at, at Deezer because Deezer is a, is um, has a lot of data-driven decisions. Uh, so we had a lot of data around our uh, usage, and we 
we analyzed that only 45% of your users were French speaking. And if you wanted to cover uh, much more regions, actually, um, we we went to regions where the number of the percentage of population with English speaker or who have any English um, proficiency is very very low. Uh, so if we don't, for example, if we don't uh, cover Spanish, uh, all the South America part uh, of the world is um, like no usage at all if you're only publishing English. You need to to publish your app in Spanish to be able to to get any usage on that market. Okay, so I think many developers think is English is enough. Because uh, for uh, developers, I English is, is a natural language. We read it everywhere. Yeah. But uh, as you said, it's possible. Probably not uh, the, the case for most of the users. Definitely. So it's, it's one of the things where uh, when you think about it the first time, you really think that English is okay. Yeah. And when you look at the data and you look at the specifics on, on some regions, uh, suddenly you see that if you want to have some traction on these markets, you will need to, uh, to do a full localization of your application. And it is not, a, it's not an easy thing to do uh, within an application. Uh, and um, specifically when you are doing late, when you have already a lot of features, a lot of text, etc., you will end up going to all your code to basically see if you have any string that will be output to yeah. a user. I, I have done that. Yeah, <laughs> so you know, the, you, yeah. you feel the pain yeah, when I'm talking. Pain. And so it's it's a lot of work to be able to localize an application. And obviously, if you are doing this work earlier in your development process, uh, you will end up. Um, getting uh, um, a faster way to be able to uh, to localize in the future. Localization is tricky when you want to do it right uh, because uh, translation is, um, is, is really complex. Um, one of uh, the examples of my talk is about the, there is a number of different um, words that have no translation from one language to another. For example, in uh, French, we have a word which is dépaysement. And dépaysement means when you go um, anywhere in the world which is not your home country um, and you, uh, all your habits, etc., have are different and you're not feeling at home outside. So it's, it's a word for describing this feeling. And even if the English language has more than one million words, there is no word that translates directly from dépaysement to an English word. So if you want to translate dépaysement, you actually have to make a sentence in English. And the fact is, every language in the world has this kind of words. I have another uh, word uh, in, um, in Italian, uh, which is abioco. And uh, abioco is uh, a quick nap uh, you take after uh, you, a big meal, a huge meal. Uh, so there is all these kind of words uh, that are complicated, but the first step to be able to localize it is to have your code ready for localization. And it's important from business perspective, it's important for f from the user perspective, and you need to do it earlier than you think. That's kind of my uh, key learning here. Okay. Uh, do you use the machine translation in the beginning, or do you only have manual translations? It's 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 really depend on on your budget. Uh, so um, when I left Deezer uh, two years ago, um, translating all the text from all the application. So we are talking about the web, iOS, Android, Windows, BlackBerry, uh, Amazon Fire. Uh, API, etc. Translating all this text cost us um, roughly 2,000 euros per language. Okay. And it's done by a professional translator. So uh, it's, it's really dependent on your business model, etc. For an indie mobile developer, spending uh, 2,000 uh, euros is too much money. Yeah, that's too much. Uh, so maybe, yeah, you, maybe you will start by doing a like a Bing translation. Um, within Azure, by the way, 
uh, we have an API to um, uh, to automate uh, the translation. So you can uh, definitely write a kind of script that uh, do it. We also have a tool, uh, which is I think is uh, the MLTK. Um, I, I don't remember the name, but I will put it in a, in my blog post on my on on my website. I will uh, send you the link. Um, that kind of do it for you, that calls Bing for you, so you can have a like a basic translation. It's, it's not great, but it's okay. Uh, people will understand it. Uh, but if you are uh, if you are having a, like a professional service, etc., maybe you will end up using a, um, using a professional translator, or maybe you will use a mixed because. One of my other key learnings here is that, uh, for example, let's take the Deezer data uh, from Deezer usage. Um, if we add French and Spanish and that's it, only these two languages, we only cover 50% of our users. And if we want to cover 75%, um, we need to add, I think, three or four langu other languages. Um, on top of that, but if you want to go like to 99% of our users, uh, we need to go to add like up to 28, I think, uh, languages. So it's it's easy to have two or three languages that will cover most, you yeah. know, of, of your users. But going to cover all your different users will take so much energy, and you need to add so many languages. But maybe for these um, small languages. Um, you will end up using um, machine translation, uh, AI translation, and for your biggest languages, maybe you will prefer to use a, a professional, so mixing both uh, way of translating content. Yeah, things like a good st strategy if you don't yeah. have an unlimited budget. Yeah. Uh, but I have a little bit of an interesting story. Me and Johan Carlson, we did a mobile game a couple of years ago, but and we find people all over Europe that helped us with translations mm -hmm. because it was a very um, well heavy. It was a word game. But uh, we had uh, people in Portugal, Italy, that helped us building uh, word lists and also did the UI translations. So that was great. And, uh, uh, so communicate with the community and uh, probably will find developers in other countries that can help you. At least they can help you to test your translations. So if you, is, if it's maybe not the case if you are an enterprise building mobile app, but as an indie developer, you can get help from other developers in the community. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Uh, using crowded translation is is also a way of doing things. Uh, it's it really depends on what's your application. Uh, we cannot imagine Microsoft using this because if somebody mistranslate something or uh, intentionally put a wrong translation yeah. on it, uh, it can have a huge impact. Uh, but definitely if you're an indie developer and, and it's clearly your, like the marketing of your application is clearly oriented uh, with that in mind, uh, it's it's definitely a way to uh, to improve your translation with a very low budget. Yeah. Okay, so let's continue with the the next story. If you was uh, said everything <laughs> you want to say about yep. localization, so uh, my my other story is about uh, net neutrality. So it's it's an interesting. Um, so I if uh, some of you are um, following um, Microsoft uh, events, maybe you have heard of uh, Mark Rusinovich, which is the CTO of Azure. And a few years uh, back, he was doing a session, uh, the case of unexplained, case of the unexplained, sorry, um, which basically uh, he took a, a bug he had on his system and, and go uh, go on and and use a lot of uh, tools to be able to uh, understand what this uh, it's the underlying issue without having access to the code of the application. And he was debugging a lot of Windows issue uh, by by that way. And it's um, it's kind of happened to me um, uh, with a story where um, so we had in all my application I one of the first thing I do is to add telemetry. Uh, so there is a lot of ways to add logging and telemetry uh, depending on your framework, depending on your needs, etc. Um, one of them is to use um, 
uh, Microsoft App Center um, uh, application insights. Yeah. Uh, and it, it can provide you already a lot of information about what your users are using, what features are most popular. Um, when there is a crash, you can get a, a crash report uh, with the date, stack trace, etc. But sometimes, uh, sometimes you have nothing. And it was a case uh, with this story. Everything, so um, we had a process where basically each time we have a new issue, uh, a new crash report uh, with a new exception, so some exception we haven't seen before. Um, all the mobile development team receive an email. So we are really focused on um, having a high quality bar uh, on that. And so we had no mails. Uh, I routinely check all telemetry systems and everything was okay that, uh, that week. But um, we also spent a lot of time reviewing all the comments uh, from the different stores. And we have even uh, developed uh, tools to automate that process of uh, reviewing uh, these comments. And we started to see on, on the Windows uh, mobile app back then, um, a lot of comments um, on from user, but just saying, okay, my, my Deezer application is saying that um, my mobile phone is offline. So it's switch the uh, digital application to the offline mode. While I'm still in 4G and still have network and all my other um, applications that use internet are able to use internet. I still receive email, etc. And that's it. But when you have like 10 different comments in one day saying that, it's probably that there is, it's not a, you know, a problem between key and uh, between keyboard and share is is it's a real issue you have in your application, but we have absolutely no data about it. Um, we had a bunch of uh, internal tests uh, for application, so basically we run uh, a lot of unit tests uh, on top of our uh, model, which is uh, run itself on top of our uh, HTTP client uh, because we have uh, developed our own HTTP clients for streaming. Uh, so we run our tests, everything is okay. We test on our own mobile phone, everything is okay. So there is an issue, but we have no way to understand it. And a few days later, uh, one comment, one user sent us a comment and said in the comment, oh, and by the way, my uh, telco operator is blah, blah, blah. And this was really important. Uh, it was one of the major uh, telecommunication operators we covered. So uh, we managed to get a bunch of SIM cards from this operator. We load these uh, SIM cards on uh, um, test mobile phones and we test the application. And we figure out that for only some of these SIM cards, the application was not uh, functioning. Uh, so w we had a repro step. Uh, and it was very weird because all the SIM cards should have been the same uh, subscription profile. Uh, mm. So it's like a okay. the basic uh, subscription in France, um, like unlimited data, etc. Um, but some of them are not working. Um, so we added a lot of uh, telemetry. Um, and logging because we were not um, able to determine what we were doing uh, specifically that caused that issue. And we ended up uh, looking at the code uh, we wrote for detecting if we had network or not. And it's it's really, really tricky to on a mobile phone to detect if you have internet connectivity or not. No, no. Uh, there is a plugin on Xamarin, there is a plugin for that. Um, and they changed uh, a few months ago, they changed the way they were doing the check uh, to a better way to doing the check, but it's not, it's not still is not perfect. Um, first, you cannot rely on what's, what is sent by you uh, by the system because the system is not checking really internet. It is checking that the connection to the uh, hotspot or to, uh, to the uh, cellular antenna is working. So it's like if you uh, take an internet cable, you plug in on both ways, but you don't know if on the other way there is internet. You just know that your cable is plugged in. That's it. 
Um, another thing we were interesting is, do you have access not only to the internet, which is not really relevant for us as an um, application developer, but do you have access to our own backends? So do you have access to Deezer API and not to just general internet? Uh, because, I don't know, maybe you are using the Wi-Fi from your corporate network, and maybe your corporate network allows you to go to Google, Bing, and some other website, but blocks Deezer because it's streaming music. And yeah, I worked on a company that uh, blocked Spotify and YouTube, for example. Yeah. So probably Deezer as well. Yeah, probably Deezer. So uh, definitely you don't want to just only check if you have access to Internet, but just check also if you have access to your backend services. And for doing that... Um, we we had a code that is running at specific time uh, during the application lifecycle. Uh, a simple HTTP request to api.deezer.com slash robots.txt because it was a very small file, a very small payload, um, and we just uh, we were just doing a header request on this uh, just to get um, uh, to get that. Um, that, that kind of ping, you know, and and we we we, di we didn't want to execute any server side code because if there is if the backend is broken, then the backend telemetry should alert us that something is broken and not the clients yeah. uh, telemetry. Yeah, um, and for doing that, way many years uh, before. We added a, s a subtle difference uh, within that code is we have added an HTTP header to this request if modified since um, to avoid any local cache. So basically, uh, we force any HTTP uh, layer with this header to re-execute the request and not retrieve uh, this uh, robot.txt file from, uh, from any local cache. And the fact is, this operator uh, in the system has somewhere an HTTP uh, proxy slash HTTP accelerator. And there was a misconfiguration on some of their servers. But when you add these specific HTTP headers, the system hangs somehow and add a delay um, of 30 seconds, half a minute, for any HTTP requests. Ooh. <laughs> And our um, our timeout was um, it with, within the app. We have set our timeout for this request to uh, three and a half seconds because if for three and a half seconds you didn't manage to get robot.txt, you will never end up streaming any music. So that's why we chosen that time. Yeah, three and a half seconds is, is a long time if you if you're waiting for something at least. Yeah. So. Definitely. So, yeah, what's, it, it was a weird issue. Uh, we managed it with the operator uh, when we discovered that. Um, but we also changed a few things uh, in our process uh, uh, to rely less. First, rely less on, on this um, HTTP header, uh, like adding query parameters to change the URI so nobody will... Uh, uh, at least nobody um, implementing the RFC uh, uh, should uh, should cache it, and also we have added um, a system to filter the telemetry on the client side, uh, because we had a lot of telemetry uh, going from this, um, uh, and we didn't want to uh, spend user money, user data, uh, to send that kind of irrelevant uh, telemetry for us. Mm course so um, we also had a uh, few months later at the beginning of summer uh, a related and interesting uh, story about uh, network and HTTP um, that time we had uh, telemetry data um, and, and we received a, a new telemetry exception saying that an internal exception occurred within our um, um, Deezer API parser. So basically, the Deezer API is uh, based on a JSON file. So we have a, um, we are using a, a JSON parser, and if this parser fails to parse the 
global API envelope. So any message is within a specific uh, envelope. And if we ha didn't manage to parse it, we raise this specific exception. Um, so it's difficult if you don't have the image, but uh, maybe you can link to the slides of my uh, yeah, I can talk. Add so that to the show notes. So um, people who are listening to the podcast can can see it. Um, we receive an email from our um, um, telemetry system, and as 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 you wish, I, I can show you so you can have the reaction of of the auditors. Uh, actually, we receive an email. Uh, like this. So uh, if you don't see the image, uh, basically uh, within the email uh, subject, we have a HTML. And when you open the email, uh, the or telemetry system didn't escape that HTML. So basically, I receive an email half containing the content of the HTTP request and half containing the data from the telemetry. <laughs> Okay, that's also really strange. Yeah, it's it's <laughs> really really strange. Yeah. So <laughs> it's intrigues us uh, when when we receive that kind of email. Uh, so first we change our telemetry system for something more robust, and then we we explored that that issue. And uh, in fact, um, what this uh, email says is basically uh, welcome to uh, the. Uh, um, Camping de la Perroche, which is a, a camping for hikers, uh, and it's it's a real camping. Uh, okay. We we found it online, and and the fact is um, that summer specifically, we did not really know why, but a lot of people were going uh, to camp, and they connect to the free Wi-Fi uh, from the camping, and you know they hit a, like a kind of a paywall. Uh, so they need to register for the Wi-Fi and say they they respect some uh, rules of using the internet, like you can have in airports, train station, yeah, etc. It's, it's, it's very common. common. Yeah, it's it's very common. But the fact is, our um, our request here, our HTTP code, uh, was simply checking the HTTP status response code, and if it's a 200 OK, it considers that he has received a response from the Deezer oh. API and so send back the um, body of the response up down to our uh, JSON parser and then our JSON parser face because it's not a JSON, it's in HTML and then yeah. our telemetry system grab that issue and send back to them, okay. back to us. Um, so it was an interesting story and, and in fact this summer we had like a bunch of different campings. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I've never so thought about that. Yeah, people before. Have, have spent a lot of time uh, in camping that summer. Um, so yes, a few key learnings uh, from this story. Uh, first, uh, when you are um, uh, developing an, an um, a code with relying on an HTTP client and an HTTP API, um, checking only the HTTP code is not uh, sufficient. And HTTP 200 OK is not always OK. Uh, you need to have additional tests, like testing the host headers to see that it's 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 matching between the host header you think about and the host header you receive. Uh, maybe even if it's, uh, this part is could be really tricky, is to pinpoint the um, HTTP certificate to ensure that the HTTP certificate you receive is one from your uh, domain name. Sorry. Uh, so yeah, you, you have to check the content type, etc. You have to check much more things than only the HTTP uh, status code. Yeah, interesting. It's things that you don't think that much about that even can happen. Yeah. And uh, a 200, uh, maybe a 401 or something, you're not authorized to connect to internet or something like that would be mo more logic. But uh Yeah, but the fact is uh, the, the HTTP status codes were curated way before we had Wi-Fi and way, way before we had public hotspots. So um, the way these hotspots are functioning is is they have no choice but sending back a 200 OK. So yeah, the probably. browser will uh, pop up a page and not some weird errors. Uh, so yeah, it's like a chicken and egg problem. They have no other solution but doing that bad thing because if they are doing other thing, then their solution will not work. Uh, 
Um, so yeah, but it's definitely something you may want to think about uh, when you're creating application that can be uh, used on that kind of situation, uh, especially on um, customer application and not the business uh, apps. But I think it's a very common scenario because, okay, mobile data became cheaper, so Wi-Fi hot water is not that relevant today as it was f five years ago, but uh, I still uh, think people are using them a lot. Yeah, because um, when you are in your home country, maybe you will not use any hotspot at all, uh, and that's okay. Uh, in Europe now, we have chance uh, that um, uh, Europe uh, pass a bill to waive any uh, roaming um, fees. So uh, even if I have a French, I have two actually two French mobile subscription. Uh, I'm here in Sweden, and I can use uh, my subscription with absolutely no limit, like I was in France. Uh, so it's great for Europe, but when you travel uh, in all the places in the world, I've, I've been in Dubai um, like once and a half months ago, and in uh, Singapore, and like it's it's like I, I don't want to say anything wrong, but I think it's it was like uh, eight euros per megabyte. Oh shit! Uh, so when you're traveling in this kind of um, places, you definitely need to use some hotspot Wi-Fi. Yeah. Because it's is you you cannot afford it. Uh, so yeah, as I said before, uh, let's switch to um, to my next story. Uh, as I said before, um, a diesel mobile team um, grew um, quite well during uh, the time I was there. Um, if we look at the uh, company numbers, so I joined Deezer uh, when we had like 50 employees and four and a half year later, I joined Microsoft and left, uh, obviously, Deezer, and we were almost 500 employees. Oh, that's a so <laughs> it's a 10, uh, 10x increase in four and a half years. Uh, so it's it's pretty massive expansion, uh, as you can imagine. And um, even if these numbers are on the, uh, it, it was it's the number of the company of the number of people, all the company, not the um, engineering uh, department, but we had kind of that same growth uh, within the within the company. And so at the beginning, um, we organized all the um, engineering teams uh, per platform or per technology. Uh, so we had the lead uh, mobile engineer, um, under him we had three uh, mobile lead, one for Android, one for iOS, and one for Windows. And under them, we had the um, different um, iOS, Android, and Windows developers. Okay, but then you're bu built up with different languages, different platforms for different uh, for iOS and Android and so on, not the uh, platform, uh, cross-platform tool like Xamarin or uh, other... Yeah, so uh, uh, it's, it's, a, um, it's a good question. Yeah, uh, these are... Uh, because Deezer is heavily relying on on most of the code is is written around the audio engine, uh, which is a custom made audio engine, which is able to uh, remove the DRM, uh, the rights management of the music, at playtime, uh, which is on uh, proprietary technology. So basically, even if you stop the process and look at the memory. You will only have like one second of uh, unprotected music uh, in in the memory. So we we, we are really um, decrypting uh, as as uh, as you play uh, as you playing uh, the the music. So because we are doing a lot of things within this audio engine, including um, um, right protection. Um, even some part of the Android apps are written in C++ oh, okay. to be able to, to do this. So uh, we think about a few times um, using cross-platform framework like Xamarin or like uh, like other ones. Uh, but as we had so many code written specifically 
for supporting a specific OS. And, and in Android, it's even more complex because all Android devices don't have the same MP3 software decoder uh, embedded. So we also have to adapt to different uh, software and hardware, hardware uh, MP3 decoders. Um, it, it was not a good candidate to, uh, to do cross-platform uh, development, or we have to do so much thing uh, to be able to have an interoperability between the uh, cross-platform part and the native part of the application. But it was not really interesting to uh, to to go that way. Okay, oh, that's interesting to hear, because so you you can in summary you can and uh, probably other you can integrate with native code, but it's pro probably not worth it, like you say in those cases. Yeah. So. Is not worth it uh, for uh, two different reasons. The first one is we had a huge part of very native code. Uh, again, Android, we are using the not the ADK, but the NDK, Native Development Kit, in C++. Uh, so it's the first reason. And, and the second reason is uh, not related to really a technology point of view, but more on the history of the product. Uh, Deezer launched the first mobile app as a, a G2ME app, a Java, Java app. Then may, they ported it over to the Android SDK. Then they made a, a port uh, to iOS in Objective-C. And then they made it to uh, C-sharp uh, with Windows. So actually, the oldest code base was the Android one. And the most portable one if I say so, was a Windows one. So if we want to go on the Xamarin side, we will need to rely on the Windows code we have written. And if we want to go, I don't know, for React Native, etc., we will need to rebuild from scratch the application. Uh, and the fact is, um, as Windows uh, has way less users than Android or iOS, um, we did not have the same resources, so we didn't have the same number of developers. And when I left the mobile team, because I've, I had an, another job at Deezer before joining Microsoft, um, when I left the mobile team, we had like two Windows developers for 10 Android developers and 10 iOS developers. And we were almost able to ship the same feature at the same time. But all the history all the number of small features that were added during um, the 10 years of um, of the application development are so much work to port over to C Sharp, but this is not worth it. Uh, of course. Uh, if if we were to create Deezer from scratch now, it may be a different story because uh, the audio engines on mobile platform have evolved during all these years, but uh, at the time, is is was not um, uh, a good choice. So for for a long time, it was pretty uh, a pretty good solution to have a separate teams and one per platform because it was three different code bases. So why should we have based on developers. The fact is, as Deezer is growing and as the uh, mobile teams are growing uh, behind, behind Deezer, we started to have uh, more and more differences, uh, feature differences between the different platforms. Because uh, the Android team, I don't know, let's take an example. The Android team start to work on uh, a specific feature uh, from January to March but the iOS team is still doing another feature, so they will not be able to start working on that same feature before uh, mid-February. And then we will end up uh, shipping an Android application, but as a feature which is not in the iOS app, and or the other way, uh, the, the other way around. And it was uh, really frustrating for the users uh, because most of the users are nowadays are cross-platform. Yeah. Uh, maybe they have an Android phone, but they have an iPad. Uh, maybe they have a Windows at home, but they have an Android tablet. Uh, so it's very frustrating for them to use the same service on different platforms and not be able to complete the same tasks. 
And it was also frustrating for our product management teams uh, who are trying to ship a feature at a specific time and, you know, uh, build on it, uh, build uh, a momentum around some uh, feature launches with press release, etc. But when in a press release we write, okay, this feature is right now in Android, but you need to wait three months, four months, six months to be able to have it in iOS, as, as it's not working. At, at a specific scale, it is not working anymore. Uh, so we switch to um, um, what we can call a feature team. So basically, is a team uh, which is responsible for a specific part of the product and a specific uh, a number of features. And within that team, you have any uh, uh, any type of developers or any other roles. Uh, some of them are data scientists, for example, to be able to build autonomously all these features. Um, so it's. Um, it's a different way of working. Uh, suddenly, the Android developer is working side by side with an iOS developer, and even maybe doing some pair programming or map programming. Um, so it has a, a lot of positive effects uh, because uh, features are shipping um, um, in more synchronous way. Uh, we still have issue with the app store submissions, but it's uh, it's another thing. Um, feature are more uh, equals, if I can say so, between platforms, because they are built on the same time by the same team. So it's 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 more a closer um, way of functioning for all the all the features. Um, but we still had some issues uh, because. Basically, uh, even if you are a part of a specific feature team and you are the only iOS developer on that team, at the end of the day, all the different feature teams are shipping the same package, the same APK, IPK, or Apex. So you, you absolutely need to coordinate things across the different feature teams. Uh, and, and for that, maybe because it's in, we are in French, in France, um, we have organized a, bun a bunch of uh, breakfasts, uh, and it was like a ritual. So, any team member have at least like two different breakfasts on the same week, every week. Um, so we had breakfast for the feature team, and we also have breakfast per technology. So, every every Monday morning, all the Android developers gather together. On Tuesday was all the company. On Wednesday was all the iOS developers. On Thursday was all the uh, Windows developers, because we still have even if you have in in this feature team organization, we still have cross cutting uh, concerns. Uh, telemetry, for example, um, if you are uh, working on the playlist part of the application, you are still building on upon a telemetry system that will be used by all the other developers from all the other feature teams. Uh, so for that kind of concerns, uh, we still need to have um, different moments uh, during a sprint uh, to be able to coordinate uh, on on these things. Yeah, sounds uh, like a good way because uh, I guess even if you're building different features, you will rely on same shared code in many cases. Yeah, definitely. That's to say, for example, telemetry or uh, uh, doing HTTP calls and things like that. So yeah, it's interesting to hear. Uh, I haven't worked in that big projects <laughs> before, so yeah. Um, maybe you we can uh, go on to the next story about uh, mobile navigation. Yeah. So uh, again, if if you're uh, listening to us, I I encourage you to. Uh, check out the slides uh, because uh, to understand the issue, um, it's it could be tricky to explain it uh, um, and to have good um, uh, good vision of the issue um, only by listening to the podcast. So maybe just uh, for uh, one minute, uh, go check out the uh, the slide, the introduction slide of of this part. Um, so um, Deezer is quite a complex application. It's not the 
most complex application in terms of number of screens. I'm, I'm pretty sure there is a, a lot of enterprise, internal enterprise uh, or business apps that are much more complex, that are much more screen, etc. Uh, but we still have like uh, 50 to 100 different screens uh, within the application. And the other thing which is quite complex is the um, um, navigation map. So for some pages, for example, if you take an album page, you have maybe like five or eight different ways to end up to that page. Uh, maybe it's a recommended album on your home page. Uh, maybe it's one of your previous listening. So you will have on your profile page, you have an history tab and you will find it from the history tab. Uh, maybe you are uh, going to an artist page and you can see that album uh, you can go to that album page from the artist page, etc., etc., etc. So, it's when you are looking at a page, at a specific page of the application, there is many ways to come from that page, and with a different state. Uh, for example, if you come from the uh, artist page, we already have loaded part of the data. We already have the um, album cover. Uh, image loaded. We already have the album name and obviously the artist name because you are on the artist page. Uh, but maybe if you are looking at the uh, at your listening history, we only have the track, one track on this album. We most of the time have the cover again uh, for Matt screen, but it, you know we only have one data uh, basically. Um, so how do we manage to be able to, uh, from anywhere within the application, to go to anywhere and maybe pass some data um, like it was a request? So I want you to load the uh, album page with the ID 16523. Or maybe pass on an object because you already have started to have some something. And on and so you want to have a great user experience because when you click on the album page, you will already see, and maybe with night nice transition, uh, and for example, in our, uh, in, in Android framework, we have a lot of uh, great transition with material design, uh, or the latest uh, Windows 10 version as well, we have continuous, uh, continuum uh, transition, etc. So maybe you want to have that kind of su sweet, smooth transition to the album page still starting to show some data and then in the background do the appropriate um, request to the API to collect the missing data. So it was quite a challenge uh, for us to, uh, uh, to to implement this. We wanted to have a system uh, which was cross-platform, so we didn't want to have a different way to navigate on iOS, iOS Android and, and Windows. Um, and we have also other um, uh, key requirements. Um, we wanted to be able to change anything at one, t at one time because uh, Deezer uh, is doing a lot of A-B tests. Um, uh, we also we were doing a lot of uh, progressive rollouts. So basically when we redesign a page, we will not show it to all our user base at once, but we will uh, progressively uh, roll out with uh, changes to, to our user base. So uh, it is not something that needs to be done at build time or at publish time. We need to be able to do it live in application already deployed uh, on, the, on the marketplace. Um, and we were also relying, and it's one of the key learnings of the experience, uh, a lot of deep links. Uh, so you know deep links uh, when you don't have HTTP um, slash slash uh, your website, but mm. you have kind of your own protocol extension. Um, and actually we have Deezer, so you can do Deezer dot slash slash blah blah. And you, uh, if you have already Deezer installed on your PC, laptop, uh, mobile phone, tablet, etc., it will launch uh, the application. Uh, and we were uh, using a lot of uh, the deep links into email, into social media sharing, into advertisement, etc. And and for uh, even like a promotion into festivals, 
for, so for a lot of marketing etc uh, uh, things and um, so what we've done is uh, basically we 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 had some iteration you can see them uh, in a, in the slides but we decided that um, any navigation within the application first will not be instantiated uh, by the view itself so depending we don't have for on, on Windows uh, on Windows Phone and Windows 10 we have most for for mostly all the application have an MVVM architecture so it's yeah, okay. uh, any navigation is initiated by the uh, view model uh, but it was a little bit different in Android and iOS uh, mm -hmm. but basically it's not the view we're starting with responsible for starting the navigation it's something behind uh, the view um, anything when, when we want to navigate to another screen we need to use an URI there is no other way to navigate to a screen other than using an URI even internally uh, within the app um, and, um, and and we have created uh, two uh, key uh, elements uh, for one first one it, it was an URI mapper so that way when we receive when the navigation service receives an URI it will try to map it to an internal URI so sometimes it's already an internal URI sometimes it's a short link we have created and on the fly depending on the user configuration we can change uh, the final destination of this uh, short link or we can receive a deep link and we translate the deep link from the deep link structure to an internal navigation uh, URI. Um, and the second thing we created is um, what we have called a page descriptor. So it's it's basically a class that defines what kind of parameters, uh, first, what kind of internal URIs points toward this specific page, what is the uh, internal implementation of this page, um, so the view and the view model corresponding to to that specific page, but that specific route, if you say, it's it's yeah, it's it's more a description of a route than a page. Actually, we we name it page, but it's, uh, when you think about it, it's it's much much more like a route. Um, all the uh, regular expression that we can use to map from any other URI to this specific URI. Uh, and other things we have added uh, during uh, during the time, uh, and we end up uh, having uh, a system which is first really simple to use from anywhere within the application. And adding a new page to the application was literally a one or two minute job. Um, we even have created uh, at least on the Windows team we have created a new item template in in Visual Studio. To be able to create the page, the page descriptor, and the um, view model um, directly, and we also managed to have the same deep links working on any platform we support. Uh, so any user can share on Twitter, for example, a track, and anybody who is using the app, even on any other platform, can can go on that specific track uh, through uh, through a deep link. So yeah, it's it was a uh, it was a key uh, key learning, and I and I think that deep links and um, um, the fact that you, but you need to use um, uh, URI, but basically a way to not using the a specific type to navigate uh, or specific activity if you are on Android, etc. Uh, it's really enabling a lot of scenarios. And and when I review application codes, I don't see so many uh, apps doing uh, doing things that way. So I'm I'm quite happy that uh, Xamarin Forms uh, 4.0 release uh, shipped a new uh, navigation service and also the shell, uh, which is kind of building on that idea to uh, to decouple uh, the real implementation of a screen and the way you navigate to to that screen. Because uh, the the old summary forms way, I don't know if it's right to call it 
old because it's, you can still use it. Yeah. Uh, but um, you, as you said, it's hard coupled to pages. And the uh, Android activities, and in if you develop Android apps or use U UI view controllers mm. for iOS and things like that. But many MVVM frameworks trying to decouple them. MVVM Lite has uh, the key, and you map keys to pages and things like that. It's a little bit similar, not that complex, probably as your ma mapping system, but. It's it's really interesting to have a, to have a key system. Uh, the. Um, the issue with the key system for me is that it's it's fixed at build time most of the time. Uh, while we with the deep link thing, we were able to uh, implement a lot of fallback scenarios. So, for example, if we have I don't know um, if we create um, a link to go to the directly to the biography of a specific artist, and each this page ships in the version two point three. Uh, of the app, on the other, um, on the previous version of the application, because of the regex system, we'll be able to say, okay, if you look at the an, an URI, which is in form of diesel.com slash artist slash one, two, three, five, slash anything, basically you redirect the user to the artist page. And later on, we add a sub um, deep link, uh, if we can say it that way, slash artist blah 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 slash biography then we would point it directly to the biography but for the other ones the experience is still okay because they they end up on the artist page and they just have to scroll or to change the tab to go on the biography so they end up going to near where should be but it's supporting all the other applications okay that's really nice and and it's it's even more important in in a mobile world where we have this gate of the App Store. Uh, it is not really the case on the Windows Store or on the Google Play Store because submission is, is a really short process on, on these two marketplaces. But on the Apple App Store, you can still have weeks uh, before your application um, update end up in the stores. Uh, so, so when you're developing a mobile application, you really need to think about what I may add next to my release, but when it will be out, it will break my previous applications. Um, and and doing things that way uh, prevent us to to to, to break uh, not everything, but a few things. Yeah. Really interesting to hear <laughs> hear your stories and your big experience of mobile development in a scale that many developers never have yeah. worked with. But uh, I think. Uh, developers or smaller applications could have used of your experience as well it definitely because it's it's um when i talk uh when i um, um describe all these stories uh sometimes I, I get the feedback of whoa you have thinking about so many things it's it's great and you're so advanced etc and i don't think it's um, I don't think it's a good um, scale, it's a good metric. Uh, it's, it's not because we are smarter than other developers, etc. It's just because we had a roadblock and we had to go over that roadblock and that's it. And I think that um, a lot of developers, if they encounter one of these roadblocks, will be able to go over them. So the fact is, having worked on so on few high scale applications um, uh, give you so much opportunity to to have so many roadblocks uh, that you need to uh, to pass on that's it uh, and and um, in France we have chance to have uh, specifically in Paris uh, we have a few other applications that are uh, kind of at a bit scale um, I don't know if you know, if you heard about, and I'm not sure it's the same names in, in Sweden, but uh, Mythic, The Fork, TripAdvisor, um, uh, Blablacar, uh, which is a ride-sharing uh, application. Okay, uh, TripAdvisor, I know. Yeah, uh, TripAdvisor, probably obviously. Go global, but... Uh, but the other ones are um, also deploy and kind of large-scale, more than 
10 different countries in the world, 10 of millions of users, etc. And, and we had a group of uh, lead developers, mobile lead developers uh, in Paris when we uh, exchanged ideas, etc. Okay. Basically, we, we all encountered this kind of issue because of our scale. Uh, but it's it's still relevant for almost any developer, uh, any mobile developer. Whenever you scale, uh, you you could benefit from this insight. Maybe you will not uh, like for the navigation system. It took us several sprints uh, of work. So it's like uh, I don't know, uh, it's ten of days of of code just to have the navigation system implemented. So it's definitely a lot of work. Maybe you will not need it uh, for your uh, small application. But it's interesting to know that if your application is growing or if you are um, if you are developing for different platforms, etc., maybe you want to think about some of these ideas and maybe just only implement uh, s s only a small part of the broader ID. Yeah, I think so. Uh, you can adapt it to your scale, but if, if you have those yeah. ideas and you can uh, think from them and uh, customize for your needs. Yeah, exactly. Okay, I think we have talked over an hour now, so oh. <laughs> I will I'm give you some rest <laughs> before your uh, talk here at uh, the conference. So thank you very much for joining me for this recording. And uh, uh, one last question, how can the user find you on social media, for example? Or contact you? Sure. So uh, the best way to find me and also to contact me is to go on Twitter. Um, my uh, username is C, as in Christopher, and Manu, M-A-N-E-U. Or just search for Christopher Manu. Um, you can also find me on my uh, website, which is uh, Manu, M-A-N-E-U, uh, dot Fr, like in France. Um, it's only in French for now, but um, my objective in June is to reborn my English blog. Uh, so maybe you would prefer to go to uh, manu, m a n e u dot net and not dot fr. Huh? Okay, I will add those uh, links to the show notes as well, so it's easier to find them. Yeah. Okay, Thanks. thank you, and thank you for listening. Thank you for having me. Have a good day.